All right, man. We'll listen. Um, first, Wes, thanks for coming to Austin. Do me a favor. Let's start the podcast by you introducing yourself. Sure. Kirk, thanks for having me. Uh, so I'm Wes Cummins, uh, founder and CEO of Applied Digital. Uh, we are what we refer to it as next generation digital infrastructure. So we're, we're basically building high power density data centers that for accelerated compute, mostly you know AI uh, workloads. So that's generally what the company is. Listen, that's fantastic. So we're going to unpackage a lot of that stuff. That's why this is a little bit of a long version because next gen data centers are the biggest focus for us. Um, could we start from the beginning? I know you're from Idaho. What yep. part exactly? So I'm from Southern Idaho, uh, potato country. I grew up on a potato farm. Nice. Uh, it was an interesting time. I this uh, unfortunately for my kids, I I think this doesn't really exist anymore. So this was right before the transition to corporate farming. Uh, so it was a lot of family farms, small community. The town was 200. Community was you know a little bit bigger than that, but 200 people. So the whole community did everything together. Uh, almost everyone was farmers. And uh, all the kids grew up working on farms. And uh, it was a great way to grow up. I have six brothers and one sister, and we all kind of you know did that together. My dad provided uh, he provided motorcycles and guns for us, guns for hunting, motorcycles to work on the farm. Uh, and if you could imagine a lot of boys together with, you know, those Did things you ever thrown into the mix. Shotgun? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, but we, we actually, the majority of what we like to do was, uh, skeet shooting or, or trap. Sure. Yeah. So what was the funnest thing to shoot back in Idaho? Because it's a lot of great bird hunting up there. I'm yeah. sure like chucker and quail and pheasant and dove. Uh, the most fun was pheasant. Yeah. Uh, you it's know, like shooting a hot air balloon. Yeah. <laughs> it's just <laughs> the fun. It's just, you know, uh, if you've hunted, so ducks are, to me, were boring. You yeah, sit too. and you wait. Geese were kind of similar. a limit of five. You're like, this video yeah. game's over. But it, you, you know, in Idaho, you're sitting out and it's freezing and you're, you're sitting there for sometimes hours waiting for these to come in. You're calling them, whatever. Pheasant, you're walking the whole time and then just jumps and, you know. Got to get some birds. You guys hunt with birds. Yeah. All right. You got, I, I, I haven't found nearly as much joy or fun or success in hunting those types of birds without dogs because you need those dogs to bit them up. Yeah. So, uh, one of the, the best stories I have is we had, uh, my dad let me get this dog when I was, uh, I was probably in the sixth grade and I found it in the newspaper when you still used to look in the newspaper for these things, black lab for sale. Uh, $25 and it said purebred, definitely not purebred, but, uh, so $25 and the, you know, my, I went to my dad asked and he said, if you can get it for 10 and here I'm, I'm 12 years old. I'm already learned to negotiate. Yeah. So 10. And so I called these people 10, maybe 15 times. And I just worked and worked and worked until the guy was finally exhausted and said, fine, 10 bucks, come get this dog, $10. I go tell my dad, got him down to 10 bucks. My dad goes, picks this dog up. Uh, it was his best friend from high school oh. that I had been negotiating. Did he know you were negotiating with his best <laughs> no, friend from high school? Had no idea. And so he, uh, negotiating his best friend from high school down <laughs> $15 though. And then, then my dad was embarrassed. He felt so cheap. He has his kid negotiating 15 bucks off of, uh, off of this dog. But we, so we have this dog that was never trained, definitely not purebred best pheasant hunting dog that I've ever seen. And we'd go out with people that, you know, we, we just hunted right on the farmland, right? Yeah. The family farmland. And we'd have people come with us that were real sophisticated dressed, you know, in premium hunting gear. We had the stuff that we worked on the farm, you know, on, and, uh, they had some really trained dogs, like these dogs they'd sent off for training. They were there. These dogs missed every single bird, ran over the top <laughs> of every single bird. And then we get the, the $10 black lab from the newspaper out pops up, you know, 10 or 15 birds. We all have a great time. And I had a big laugh about that, but, uh, yeah, probably the best hunting story I have. That's cool. Well, we're going to put some more hunting stories under your belt there. Uh, so if you're one of eight and you're growing up on a potato farm, what were, what were you the youngest middle? Old? I was a uh, third to the oldest. So some call it somewhere in the middle. You had some responsibility, but not all of it, I guess. Yep. So, uh, when you're working in Utah or in Idaho, are you at the time thinking like, man, this is living, I love this here. Or are you like, I'm going to leave Idaho. So uh, people ask me, you know, what, what did you learn growing up on a farm? And there was two things I learned. 
uh, you know, responsibility and hard work that counts as one. And the other thing that I learned from growing up on a farm was I did not want to be a farmer. And so, you know, the only thing I know, let's, let's get really good grades in school. Right. And, and that wasn't really a priority where I went. So I, you know, got good grades, got into a good, you know, university and I, I wanted to not be a farmer. And you, you make these choices sometimes when you're, you know, say you're eight, nine, 10 years old and you're standing in a, in a wet, in a wet field, uh, five 30 in the morning, then it's, you know, 50 degrees outside and you're freezing and you've got about two more hours of that to, you know, kind of get in Idaho, you irrigate. So you had this responsibility of irrigation in the morning and at night and sometimes middle of the day. So, and no matter what was going on, you had to do, yeah, you yeah. know, the irrigation, you had to go move the pipes or, you know, several different kinds of irrigation. But, um, so you had that responsibility, but th those are when those choices are made for me or when they were made is you know, 530 in the morning, freezing, 5 30 in the morning watching the sun come up it was great but you know when you're eight and you'd rather be in bed uh so yeah i get it. those those were those were the two big lessons from from farming there was so many more but uh i will tell you this though it was you know me and my brothers like i don't i couldn't imagine a better way to grow up it was like my my dad made us work hard but then we got to go do stuff all day long and then we come back and work at night again so but it was great it was a great way to grow up but definitely didn't want to live that lifestyle so it was really good so uh at the same time as you're growing up and you're farming and you're learning what you don't want to do were you discovering things that you were falling more interested in because remember like we were talking earlier i'm like i don't ever look at kids grades in school as a reflection of intelligence because at that point no one was really born with the answers and they don't know shit but but if they're interested in something you're not gonna not only do they not really need a lot of your help but you can't stop them from learning it yeah so i you know my earliest interest was in in being a professional football player that's it. uh so was pretty focused on that for a while what but, position did you play uh well when you go we i always clarify this because it was a small town but we did play 11 man football so it was it was a full football you played game. both ways though it played both ways everyone played both ways so uh Early, I played quarterback, ended up kind of being a running back receiver, uh, ended up, you know, getting to go on and play in college. So that was nice, but uh, played defense. Uh, <laughs> you know, in high school, it was funny. Again, small school. So you you always start out as like, you know, free safety or maybe a cornerback and then as, as a freshman. And then as you get bigger, then you move inside, right? Like that, it was just kind of the evolution. So I think I finished as like strong safety or inside linebacker or something like that. So, um, but that I started, you know, wanted to be a football player, you know, some kind of professional athlete. I think almost every boy in, in my grade wanted well, to do that. What was the most professional sport you could relate to in Idaho? Boise State? Yeah. Well, Boise State wasn't big Powerhouse, yeah. then. Uh, so they, I think they were still a junior college. So you were a Seahawks fan. You grew up a Seahawks fan. Uh, Broncos fan. Ooh, well played. So, you know, as I was growing up, Elway. Okay. I, yeah, I yeah. loved John Elway. Uh, and, you know, Denver the whole time. There was a lot of disappointment until later, you know, and won some Super Bowls. But uh, love the Broncos. All right. So you uh, fell into football and you were a good student, it sounds like. Good student. And then, you know, kind of my junior year, senior year in high school, you know, we, we got to <clears throat> start working um, – with computers early, but the internet started to show up for us, right? And we could get, you know, dial up internet. And that was a big fascination. And and actually for a school, the school that I went to for being a really small school, my class, like a lot of the guys were interested and, you know, you couldn't do, you know, gaming over the internet because the, the connectivity just wasn't there. So we would go like on the weekend and we figured out how to network computers at the school. So you just have ethernet, man, I, I This wonder, is late eighties, early nineties. No, this was, this was like 94. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The internet of things or the World Wide web was just getting really strong. Just getting going, but, but we had ethernet. 94 is when amazon.com launched a website. Many argue that that was when the birthplace of this industry started. So we, we had originally, it was a game called Castle Wolfenstein that turned into a game called Doom. Of course. And so the first version, I can't remember if we were playing Doom or if it was Castle Wolfenstein, but it was the first time you're ever, that I knew you could do like network gaming. And, and so you we could play against someone else. Yeah. Yeah. So we'd, we'd go to the high school and we, you know, on the weekend and, and play against each other, or play on the same team or whatever it was. It was fun. So potato farming nerd that played football. Well, I'm tracking, I'm putting it all together. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense, right? So yeah. 
So, uh, how did you get drawn to the technology? It was the games. So I, I loved that. And, and just, uh, there was a lot of aspects. Do you, do you remember when you, and maybe you never did this, but you'd burn a CD, like you get, get a CD burner. Yeah. Like that was a big deal for us. So now instead of, you know, making mixed tapes that you, yeah, you have to sit you, there, you, you do it off the, you do it off the radio, radio. mixtape. So, uh, instead of that, we were burning CDs. We could, you know, pollute my, my parents' PC with like LimeWire or something to, to download, uh, Cause it was music. all legal downloading back then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was good. So, so we were just, we were all really into that. Uh, and then, uh, left, went to school. Missouri, and, uh, yeah, Missouri. Uh, Wash U, Washington University in St. Louis, uh, played football there, uh, started in electrical engineering, ended up in business, uh, did a lot of, you know, classes in between, but I kind of really fell in love on the, on the business side, actually late in, in kind of my junior, senior year of college. And so that was kind of the route that I took. But technology, so I'm, my background was technical too, you know, but I, when I went to school, I was like, I thought about pursuing an engineering degree. Yeah. And I felt like that wouldn't be as well balancing to me as if I went and studied business. I felt like it transcended all technology, you know, did you? So I, it, it was, and it was kind of like the view, especially the exposure I got. So, um, this was kind of 99, 2000. And so, you know, in the business school, I, uh, I, the internet was just you know, it was the, all the hype, everything was booming. And so we just got so much exposure to that from a business perspective. And I was allowed to take uh, graduate courses I and mean, they would bring really cool people in to talk about what was going on. I imagine that's on. a pretty powerful school. A lot of people don't know what that school is, but I've heard of it. And I know that's probably top 10. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it, it maybe falls in and out, but it's it's what definitely one of the top universities in the, Huge in the country. Huge networking powerhouse. And, and but they, they would bring great speakers and, you know, we'd have VCs come in, you know, investment bankers, uh, th there's, there's one that's burned in my brain where there's, you know, a VC in, you know, before the dot-com bubble burst that, you know, was talking about, you know, all of these things. And then you, you had a guy, I wish I remembered the name of the company, but he was, it was a specialty chemical company based in St. Louis. And, you know, he was given, you know, what, what they did and what they did was they made this catalog of, you know, extremely specialized chemicals, small quantities for, for research and, you know, research labs really. And, uh, and the, the VC was saying, well, I can, I, I remember him saying this, I can do, uh, create a B2B exchange in one month and just put your company out of business. And I was thinking to myself, like, uh, you know, they actually make the product, you know, it's not just how it's exchanged. So, um, that was kind of an eye opener that maybe people had gotten a little too, you know, far afield of, of what just the internet can do. Like maybe it makes better distribution, but, um, but I, I, the point of it is I got exposed to a lot of those things. And on the business side, I said, man, instead of just getting kind of pigeonholed into one thing, I think I can get exposure to a lot of different things. Uh, and so it was, it was, uh, really interesting to me. So when you were there, um, it's interesting, you know, because you look back at, you know, in 94, whatever it is that you were in school, you know, just like no difference than now, you know, we send our kids to schools today to be educated for jobs that don't even exist yet. Yep. Right. And I'm sure at that time, um, and, and not only that, but the, the technologies that they'll be using when they are, our age hasn't been invented yet. Yeah. No different than what we're looking at the barrel of today for us. For right? sure. So for you at that time, did you have a concept of which vertical of industry you were kind of gravitating towards? I, you, I, like I said, I, I really liked the finance aspect. Just so you were to, thinking about going to New York. Yeah. And, and that's where I went. Okay. Um, but I was, I was still, I love the technology and, and I love the, you know, the exposure I had early, which is to me, when I look back is crazy. I grew up, you know, in, in this tiny farming community, um, I'm trying to remember, it was probably 1985 or 86. Uh, my mom who, you know, she was, I, I don't, I don't know, maybe she saw the future, but she sent, uh, myself and my older brother and we go to the local community college and there was computer camp right? Computers were brand new. And we sat on like an Apple IIe or Apple IIc, you know, and now I went back and looked, I found it in their basement. Like I, you know, I thought that monitor was like, you know, normal monitor. It's like this big, yeah. right? It's like the, the old CRT, like right. uh, the, the monochrome, but she sent us there to, to do that programming. And that's, you know, kind of where we started, or I started falling in love with it. And then they, 
I don't even want to know what my parents paid like in inflation adjusted dollars, but they bought one of those Apple computers and like, I think it was 1986 uh, for us. And the most expensive box you can get. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, that, I think they had to spend over $2,000 and that was in, you know, 86, like inflate that up now. Still but, expensive now. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was, uh, but we got that exposure. And so I always loved that. But then, you know, the finance aspect really enamored with it as we went through, through kind of 99, 2000. And then I did go to New York, uh, work for an investment bank in New York, um, publishing research on wireless technology. Really? So it, was, it was mostly wireless hardware. So this is when you had an industry before it had been decimated, right? So you had- Because um, this is after 2000, the dot-com bus was 2000-ish. Yeah. Right? And, and, but you, so- were you an was, analyst? Is yeah, you... yeah, I was an analyst. So I published research um, and it was specifically on wireless hardware. And, you know, that industry is, which is an interesting one, you guys, you know, data center and telecom kind of go together pretty closely. But if you remember back, you know, you had six maybe tier one telecom equipment OEMs, right? You had in the US, you had Lucent, you had Nortel in Canada, you had Ericsson, you had Nokia, you had Alcatel uh, in France. And so you had all of these, then you'd kind of step down to Siemens and all these companies and they're almost all gone, right? Mm, they're, yeah. they're consolidated. Yeah, they're consolidated down. And that, that was not a victim necessarily of the dot-com bubble. That was a victim of uh, Huawei. Uh, you know, while we figured out how to make this stuff and ZTE in China, and they just crushed that industry. But so I spent time on that. That was, a, you know, starting when the dot com bubble was bursting was, you know, in retrospect, just such a good learning experience uh, as far as, you know, things getting overdone. And I think that's, you know, kind of relevant to where we are now. Well, there was a correction, it was a reset, you know, there's an adjustment. Um, and, I got out of the Navy in 2000, so I was sitting front row as I was watching uh, Exodus. You were, I mean, oh, I'm yeah, not yeah, sure yeah. if you were. Oh, yeah. So you were already Exodus, Savis, you know, groups like that, that they're not, they operate under different brands. They've gone through multiple consolidations, but yeah, that, I mean, it was an oligopoly even then. There wasn't a lot of big shops, you know, GI partners, I don't think, hadn't got into digital yet. You know, there was a lot of percolating things, but nothing at that massive scale, you know, so, um, when you were doing this stuff, were you, were you getting that? Is the breadcrumbs that took you closer to data centers or were you? So, uh, let me go through the journey of, I've, I've worked just on the finance side. I've had exposure to, it was mostly hardware. And so when, when I came into it, everything was about infrastructure. So the, the, first part of the internet was all about infrastructure, right? So you're building the networks, you're doing all the switch gears, why Cisco became the, you know, the largest company by market cap in the world. Sure. And so it was all infrastructure driven. And then, you know, as that build out kind of slowed down or, you know, matured, it continued to grow just at a much small, you know, lower rate, everything moved to software. All right. And so from, you know, maybe just before 2010, but think 2010 to 2020, when you're looking at like public companies and just companies in general, software was where every dollar was going. Everyone wanted software. That was the future. You know, hardware was commoditized and it's all going to be software. And so spent a lot of time through that. I didn't dig in a lot. No. So I went to New York and I went to LA and I was in LA for 10 years where I was still doing the same thing, you know, but tech, still industry tech, uh, uh, telecom though. It, nope. It, when I went to LA, it broadened out. And so it was, <clears throat> I guess it was just tech hardware. So it, it could be telecom equipment, wireless equipment. It could be semiconductors, you know, networking really? gear, uh, you know, all of it all the way through. So, um, so I got exposure to all of that. And then, you know, that whole kind of group, just fell out of favor for a long time. And they, you know, traded at low multiples and everyone wanted software and software companies were trading at, you know, 10, 20 times multiples. And so that was kind of where it was at. Um, and then, you know, fast forward to, to what I'm doing now, I was, uh, I was, I was doing that in 2020 and I spent a lot of time in the crypto ecosystem. And I was trying to figure out, you know, these, there was starting to be some public companies. Well, how long was this? The, the, when you got into digital crypto? Yeah, this was in 2020. So okay. it was four years ago, okay. four and a half years ago. And, you know, that I, I got really interested in that ecosystem because some of those companies. So remember my background is mostly public company investing. And so I'd spend a lot of time looking at companies and new companies that were coming public. And so some of the crypto, specifically Bitcoin miners were 
coming public. And uh, so I, was, I really dug into that and was really interested in it. And, and what, I, what I found is that the, the people that were call it the OGs, right? The, the people that were the, the, you know, that really knew what the, was going on in the industry were the, the leaders of the industry. Or no, the Bitcoin just, those go hand in hand. So mm. when you look at that industry, you see a lot of vertically integrated operators. And so they build their facilities and they own the, the, uh, the miners, the servers effectively. Right. And so I, I ended up making a partnership and, you know, starting the company that we have now, and it was going to be large scale GPU deployments, um, aimed at, uh, proof of work networks, you know, Ethereum, think Ethereum. And then there was several others, but what happened is, uh, in April is May, May of 21, China cracked down on crypto 70% of the hash rate was, was in China at the time. And really? so I had to go somewhere else. We were already looking at sites in the U S and we, you know, we had the opportunity basically to build out a lot of data center capacity for crypto and we weren't vertically integrated. We became data center. So we, the, the original idea was if you want to be a Bitcoin miner, you come to me, I have a large scale data center. We're building hundreds of megawatts. That's and, designed and for Bitcoin. That's designed specifically for Bitcoin. And, uh, this, this will sound, you know, a little bit crazy, but you know, uh, the power densities we're doing now on HPC, we're actually stepping down oh, but from yeah, the Bitcoin, Bitcoin power densities, right? Uh, obviously significantly up, but- um, to our traditional data center. We we built over a two year time frame almost 500 megawatts of Bitcoin data centers. And I don't know if you've seen any of these facilities. I haven't seen yours, but I've been in a few. Okay, so They you, typically have no engines. They don't have it's street power to yeah. a panel transformer yep. or, and then feed and rent and distributions, typically some sort of- glycol or dialectic fluid or mineral oil immersion, if not some incredible permutation that re requires a lot of water, heat jacket. The the vast majority of what you'll see is just none of that even. Really? Air cool. Really? So you're just moving. What's the density massive, capabilities of air cool that you could have? You're still running higher power density. Like but, 50, but 60 kilo. Think, think of, um, so our facilities, especially North Dakota, which is much easier to do air cool. Sure. Um, you basically have a, a roof and then a filter wall and then a wall. And then both of the walls open up besides the filters and you're just blowing all the way. Natural through. cold air in there, fish bowling. Yeah. But it's, there's no, you know, it's not like you're piping it around. You yeah. just need as much as possible, but these things are pretty rushing. So they, uh, so we're, we're building those. And, and the idea was, you know, Kirk, if you want to be a Bitcoin miner, you come to me, you know, I'll help you buy machines. You buy machines, put them in our facility we run it, Bitcoin hits your wallet, right? And then we'll just dock your wallet for your fees for, you know, your data center fees. And so anyone could mine Bitcoin at scale. And so you could get kind of those economies of scale. What practically happened was we signed up, you know, three industrial scale miners. So think of, we signed up the hyperscalers oh, in Bitcoin. Bitcoin and we, you know, we built this almost 500 megawatts in, in uh, two years, which it's not, nearly what we're building now, but still putting online, you know, 500 megawatts in that time frame, pretty tough to do. All in one place, dispersed between multiple markets? Three three sites, uh, two different sites in North Dakota and one in Texas. I got you. Yeah. Now, obviously, how many days a year do you get free cooling in North Dakota? I'm, I, that's calculated, right? I mean, there has to be some estimates on that. So, so we get up times there, even in the summer of close to 98%, which so <laughs> this, this I think is, is worth clarifying. So 95% uptime in Bitcoin land is really good. Uh, so I yeah, you know in, in data center land, you're, you're going for five nines, yeah. yeah, five nines. And, but in Bitcoin, like 95% uptime is really good. Um, but Bitcoin's unique. You can turn these off and back on and, uh, but you get free air, air cooling every single day of the year. Now you'll get some 90 degree days in the summer, but it still drops, you know, into the high fifties at night. And so, um, so yeah, it's, it's just an ideal climate, not just for that, but you know, the, the parallel here is Bitcoin is compute, right? Sure. It's just, they're doing cryptography. That's why it's crypto. And so you're just doing math, right? And they have ASICs that are driving that. And when you're doing compute, you need power for, you know, versus networking, right? Compute needs power. And that's where we're, we're back on the GPU side with, you know, the AI needs compute, not, not as much networking outside, um, but inside it does. So 
it just needs a lot of power to to run these. Power means heat, right? And so well, let me let me double tap on some of these things because this is really good. And this is a uh, like I said, uh, <clears throat> some of these podcasts are really great for entertaining and inspiring. Some of them are incredible for education. And there's a lot of us in this space that have been building data centers for a bit. And every now and then, you know, we run across a couple uh, of those opportunities that were more Bitcoin based. I have a services business. We're doing some Bitcoin right now, but we don't do a lot of that. Um, because it seemed like the soup wasn't done cooking yet, right? It seems like uh, there wasn't a lot of standardization on what they wanted. It was whatever someone would hire someone on their team that had a big fat brain and that person would decide what was good enough from an infrastructure, reliability, sustainability, whatever it was. It sounds like you standardized by creating a wholesale solution for industrial digital Bitcoin mining groups. And it didn't matter what they were really mining for. It was just a volume of power that you were selling. Is that right? That's effectively it. Yes. Okay. And then what the densities, you know, was there like a 500 watts per square foot? I mean, it sounds like you went down. Uh, right? so, I, I have to think on a square footage basis, it's going to be, I mean, what was the because, height? because yeah. of how these were built, I'm just trying to think through this, but it's, it's probably closer to a thousand. Okay. Okay. Because, because you, you get a, your square footage just isn't as big as you know you don't you just don't have the same amount of equipment right you you basically feed power in you have pdus and then you have you know racks and and the miners sitting on the racks and so that's really it so you don't you don't need all the extra space um that you would need for a lot of the other equipment you know for like tier three sure. data center uh so you get this it, it kind of both of those things come into play where you you know you get this really high power per square foot um so and back to you know you're stepping down so if you if you walked into one of our our bitcoin facilities what it would look like is you know think of it like a football field long uh so 100 yards long roughly um pretty narrow and then you have a single row all the way to the ceiling of servers just down the middle and air's flowing this side and blowing out that side and that's that's really you know it's it's not super complicated the electrical is obviously just piping you know handling that amount of megawatts sure. is pretty complicated but uh and you don't you know you're not doing any power redundancy you're not doing um you're not doing backup power you're not doing hey do we need dual feed you're not doing n plus one you're, you're just giving doing, an yeah. end solution you're yeah just, it's an end solution with a yeah and you're removing some components within that i it makes sense so I wanted people to understand that before we pivot onto next gen data centers, which sure. is what your focus on now is, were you guys an already publicly traded company by then? Yeah, so we have a unique, really unique uh, origin story from from that perspective. So take my financial background, now blend it into tech and then blend it into what, you know, the company that you see today is we started as a public company. And how do you start as a public company? Well, the way you start as a public company is I had made an investment many years ago, end up joining the board of a company that was a public company. Uh, at the time, they had a NASA contract and it was a small contract. I can't remember, it was five or $10 million a year. And they were developing a laser-based listening device um, for air traffic control. And so the air traffic control system, they have a, a wake vortex avoidance and there's an algorithm that nasa works on and depending on you know the wind speed and which way it's blowing then you you determine your aircraft spacing right S safety on spacing and so aircraft are spaced and the more you could tighten that up right you can land more or you know take off more aircraft from the same airport but it, it, we don't need to get too far into that but they were making this laser based you know acoustic device to basically sanity check that that it was working correctly um doesn't go forward. NASA ends that contract. Uh, I own a lot of the company personally. Uh, company licenses some technology out of University of Tennessee. Uh, an atmospheric plasma spends the next, I don't know, six years or so developing a medical device uh, for chronic wounds. So think of like foot ulcers for diabetics, right? And and using this, what I didn't appreciate at the time, another learning experience for me was um, how much money and time it takes to get through like a 5 10k process uh for for the fda right with a with a device and so i was doing this kind of you know and i was funding it myself and so what it, what it ended up in is we ended up mothballing that company stays you know it's a it's a pink sheet publicly traded company 
I own 70%, you know, of the shares, which is, it's kind of mine. I pay the fees, you know, annually to keep it, to keep it going. And then, you know, at some point I was like, oh, I'll offload this thing or something. And then I, you know, I had this idea and because of my, you know, relationships and the, my background, the easiest way for me to raise capital was with, you know, family offices and institutional investors that could see a path because they were mostly public company investors, but if they could see a path to liquidity over a certain time frame, So if I did it inside of what was already a public company, you know, it's probably an 18 month to 24 month time frame before they have freely tradable shares. And so we started the company inside of this shell. So it started public. Nice. As, as that crazy as that sense. sounds. No, it's, look, it I started think a lot public. of people, look, Applied Digital's on the scene. People yeah. know who you guys are. You guys have done a great job. You, Kate, there's a, like St. Chris, I, Ray, I'm, I've got the, you guys are omnipresent. And 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 I think that, I think everyone kind of looked and said, man, I, I must've been looking that t- way too long because where did this, where'd this publicly traded data center company that's building next gen data centers come from? And understanding that journey, right? And and yeah. you with your own vision and your own narrative, you know, helping us understand that arc, that's why this platform exists, yeah. right? So that we can unpackage this stuff in a long version. Because I, I like we were talking about, I'm like, I think it's really important that people understand where each other are coming from, right? Yeah, absolutely. But for you, you have a digital, you have a publicly traded data center company now, and that makes, that helps us all understand. So you really built one from the inside out versus, yeah. and that's- versus, versus, you know, starting a company, building it up and then IPOing it with the access, the early access to capital was easier this way. Now I, I will tell you this, having a company from start that's public is hard. Cause so many different rules, regulations. The rules and regulations, but also we're reporting quarterly. I mean, imagine you started a company and you're reporting publicly every three months, what your results are. And, you know, and you're trying to kind of hit the, the wall street, you know, their desire is up and to the right, but, you know, kind of steady, stable, predictable. And in a startup, it's just it's not impossible, like that at all. right? Yeah. It's impossible. And so that part has not been fun. Uh, there have been some fantastic parts, um, but there's there's definitely a big downside. Uh, and and we are, you know, we can get into this later, but we are really, in my opinion, the only publicly traded data center company that is focused on building for hyperscalers. Right? You have you have Equinox and uh, or Equinix, sorry, and uh, DLR. The there's you know, they do some of that, but that's not really the core business uh, for, for those companies. But you know, all the guys who are building for it, they're all, they're all private, right? That they're massive. That's why a lot of them have gone private too. A lot of the public charity groups had to, because to pivot into next gen data centers, you have to play the long game. Yeah. And Wall Street doesn't reward those that play the long game. They only want to see what your stuff is on a quarterly basis. Like how, how does your stock trade today? Look, it's, I don't think people understand how volatile and how ballistic it is to create a startup in a technology space. And I couldn't imagine trying to create a startup within a publicly traded company because I I didn't have the capacity in my first few years to report quarterly what I was doing accurately to my parents, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Let alone, you know, Wall Street. So, yeah. it, I mean, I'm at five years, you know, we're just coming up on our five-year mark and it, it took us four and a half years to, what I say, have our shit together, right? So it takes a bit. When were you reinventing this ship from the inside out? When did that journey begin? So but when we started the company yeah, I mean, or when, it, we, when we started into HPC from, from. Yeah. Cause it sounds like you, you you're not applied digital. You're like applied digital 3.0 now, right? Yeah. The first one was whatever it was. The second, I guess was when you were emerging with your startup. And at that time, the focus was not next gen data centers. It was Bitcoin mining and digital currency mining. Correct. It, it was, uh, I still kind of group those into next gen data centers, right? Cause it's the high power density data centers. It's but, funny you say that. So the, but you know, it really, it's not even close to what we're doing now. What we're doing now is, you know, we gained a lot of experience, but it's, it's a big lift to go from building Bitcoin facilities to building, you know, what, what the next gen data centers that we're building now for accelerated computing. But a half a gigawatt, still a half a gigawatt. Yeah. If you're deploying that much power and energy. The, the, the thing that that uh, we got from that and really helped us was uh, supply chain. Like a lot of the supply chain components are the same. You're dealing with a lot of the same vendors, especially on the electrical side. 
So it helped us build that piece of our of our company out uh, pretty well. We've ag- uh, obviously had to augment that significantly because the amount of components that are going in now versus what we we're doing before is significantly different. Different but, product. Yeah. It is interesting because I want to talk about that uh, uh, traditional data center versus next gen data center. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> what you were building, um, a lot of the what the traditional data center providers, uh, what they offered in their two end topology product, right, was um, they deployed way too much capital into infrastructure to support or make a business case to justify allocating that to Bitcoin. Yeah. Right. But um, but now I'm seeing hyperscale hyperscale and users removing major components away from their electrical permutation primarily. And and I think that as you're talking about, like there's not a regression from traditional data centers, but it's evolving out of this need for yeah. infrastructure reliability because a lot of it is built to the network topology anyway at yeah. this point. So so now we're seeing generators be, or we're seeing designs from enterprise end users primarily because the operators don't get away with, the, I mean, let me say, you guys are, are you guys selling your product on a 2 SLA? Uh, I don't know that for certain. So, so I, no, I do not know. No. Okay. N plus one. Okay. So that is different, yeah. right? And that is next generation data center stuff because reliability requirements for certain projects, like look, look at how latency sensitive cloud data centers yeah, were. Right? Absolutely. And look at how non-latency sensitive AI data centers are. And and with that, it's just like more machine, more churn, let's load more language large language models into these things and let's educate these boxes. And now there's so much going on that the reliability requirements they're not nearly as important as like overall total safety requirements for a program I'm looking at. Right. So is that what you're talking about when you say next gen? So ne- next gen for us is it's compute focused data centers, right? And it's a lot of the stuff that you're talking about. Like you're you're going you know more downstream as far as like what that actually means and how you build the facility. But at, at the end of the day, you're going from you know hyperscale you know web server data center that's feeding out all of our video streams or or any of our applications to that's running. I mean on the high end. 10 kW, probably not even that high, right? Average, yeah, maybe. Maybe 10, 12. something like that. And now- Which is high now, but it was not, I mean, it used to be three, four. I yeah, that. yeah. I mean, when, when you're going back to, you know, it used to be like retail data centers, you'd be down two, three, four, maybe. Yeah. And and then it, it was getting up. I think when I looked, when we were starting this, it's kind of seven and a half was kind of the average. That was a flex for some people. Yeah. They were running at six, seven, but they were still only utilizing 40%, exactly. 60% at yeah. tops so of what they were purchasing. Yes. And and so now, you know, we've moved up. Our first build, this was pre-chat GPT, was 50 KW. And that felt, you know, like a lot. And then as this started moving forward, we go, man, we, so the, the build now is, I think, to 120 or 150, our, our building in, in Ellendale. So it's this high power density is really what we're seeing for next gen. Uh, focus is on latency inside the data center, right? Latency inside the data center is super, super important. Yeah. And latency outside the data center, less important. Although, you know, it's coming into focus for us. There, there is limitations on this, right? You know, I, I, in pr- practically speaking, you know, training, you could build a training data center on the moon and you should be fine as long as you had a fat pipe going back and forth for the, for the data, for the training. But, you know, I think if you want these data centers for, you know, these are getting signed up for, you know, long leases, you know, 10, 15, 20 year leases, and they don't want it to just be a training facility, right? It better if it can be multi-use. Now there's, there's bigger bands around it now, as far as the limitations, but we are kind of have gotten, it's kind of come into focus for us, what we should be shooting for as far as latency. And what you're shooting for on, on these is it depends on the hyperscale customer, depends on their current footprint. And then wherever your location is, how, what's your round trip latency between their nearest current location, right? Is, is what you're shooting for. But we've, you know, from, I would say a year ago, right? It's uh, that, that piece of it has come much more into focus for us. But when you think about for me, next gen data center, high power density, ultra, ultra low latency networking inside the data center. And, and, you know, what does that mean? That means 
that most of this stuff right now is running on uh, InfiniBand, uh, which used to be Mellanox. Now it's you know owned by NVIDIA. And so an optical networking technology that interconnects the GPUs themselves, right? You're, it, you're, you're done from just networking the full server. You still network the server, but you're, you're really networking each GPU card, you know, the eight cards inside of that server. And there's a distance limitation of really kind of 30 meters from the network core for these to all work. Right. Cause, cause at the end we're building Daisy block chain. by block yeah, supercomputers, right? It's just like supercomputer. It's like modular supercomputer that you're putting in these data centers. And so, uh, that's why the power density needs to be so high because you got to stack these really close together. And because the latency inside matters much more now and the latency outside matters much less now. And so, and then, you know, and, and everything that feeds into that, right? So cooling systems are changing. Uh, we're I think 80% liquid cool at our facility in North Dakota. I mean, 80% at a, in a hundred megawatt critical IT load. I don't know that that's been done at that scale before. So cooling technology is changing. You know, people are still going back to immersion. Well, you know, I'm sure you've been in immersion facilities. You know, there's there's going to have to be some big improvements uh, there before I think you can really scale. So immersion. I was going to ask you what your thoughts were on that technology, right? Because you're the one, you sit on the side of technology where the densities would demand that you have a greater level of understanding of those evolving means and methods of um Every type of mechanical permutation, rear door heat exchangers, cold plate. What I I don't know what you're having to investigate. There's someone on your team, I'm sure, that has a big fat brain that's looking at that stuff. But, but that's a nonstop job is staying up to date on what the mechanical solution opportunities are. It's that piece is changing so fast, yeah, right? And it's and, a matter it matters most, don't you think? Yeah, it, absolutely. So, okay, we can we can deliver right 120 kW a rack fine. How do you keep the equipment cool? cool. Like how do you, from melting, how do you yeah. keep this billions of dollars worth of gear from melting inside your facility? That's really kind of the critical element. How, how do you handle that amount of power? And, you know, it's with that, that kind of density, like up, uptime is harder, right? It's just like running. So we also run GPU compute as a service and running GPU compute versus CPU compute, you know, the, the uptime it's, it's much harder to keep the uptimes where CPU compute, you know, running five, six, nines, generally no problem. GPU is much harder. It's, it's not anywhere near what I was talking about with Bitcoin, but when you get into compute and you get into the heat created, you know, you, your failure rates go up and it's just the kind of the way it is. So that's the. I would say right now, not not to make a pun out of this, but it's the most fluid part. The the cooling is the most fluid part of of the change that's going on, and I I just don't think that that's settled yet, right? I and so, so for us, you know, we're building out to the CDU, and but what is the actual rack solution? You know that that. Uh, most cases that's for our customer to decide, but I think there's a, there's a big question mark around that still. Does your team, uh, not you personally, I'd imagine not, but you're, I imagine someone from your team probably engages with the open compute forum where they're try. I mean, their, their whole purpose and intent, yeah. Rob Coyle, those guys are gene and they're great and, and hurting the nerds of the industry. Like, can you imagine how hard it is to grab all the biggest brains in the space and yeah. try to get them all to agree on a standard of anything in the space when everyone with an engineering degree wants to flex with the best idea? So how do you stop iterating and you start standardizing so you can optimize? It, well, n no one, so just standardization in general, people who are making the equipment never want it, right? Like it's just, it's an ec economic item. So just across history, right? Standardization killed a lot of companies uh, because they had proprietary technologies and, and, then they, now, and then they donated that into a standards body and you don't really, you know, really get paid for it. And so, you know, there, there's always going to be resistance to standardization because people, when it, especially when something's brand new, it's like, no, 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 no. We don't want we, code lock. We don't want to give that to you. And we make the, the best thing. Like we make the best thing. And then there's 20 other people that are like, oh, no, no, we make the best thing. Yeah. I'm trying to find standardization more like not as a silver bullet, but I think about it like this, a very homogenous industry, yep. right? That exists today that we, that I feel we're about ready to uplift the impact that it made to humanity is the automotive industry. Yep. So think about what Henry Ford did right? Uh, we think that he built a car, but in reality he built um, an entire ecosystem 
uh, of companies, a whole nother industry with a sub ecosystem that um, how many companies were created just to make tires? How many were meant to make windshields or car seats or windshield wipers or so on? And our industry is kind of like that, right? Mm -hmm. So Henry Ford created an industry that transformed humanity. It's funny that it took 46 years before, no, no, it took uh, t like 20 something years before one in four Americans adopted the automobile because Henry Ford said it best, if I gave my clients what they wanted, they would have been bigger horses, yeah. right? In reality, people don't know what they don't know. They don't know what they need. So new emerging technologies released, it's not really adopted very fast sometimes. I look at some of these technologies and wonder, like, I think that we're on track to have a more profound impact on humanity than the automobile did to society by once um, codifying this industry and standardizing it like the automotive industry, and I'll explain. There's a truck. That's a classification of a standard, but there's how many different types of trucks have you seen? But we say the word truck and we kind of could close our eyes and understand what a truck looks like. Right. If I say a car, we know what a car looks like. If I say a van, we know what those look like. Those aren't three different standards, but those are three different classifications. And within those classifications, you have industries that are emer or, uh, companies emerging within an industry that have the ability to take an edge with a silver bullet here. Like maybe the F-150 is the best for so many years, but then Dodge sneaks in on them or arbitrary names of examples. But we know those names of those oligopolies, but those are companies that transformed communities, societies, and humanity by producing a product. I think the more that we could standardize on classifications, yes. maybe. And I think that's what OCP is about, right? So I'm with you. I, I don't think you're going to get nerds that are done iterating on, and we don't want to as no, consumers. We absolutely don't. The more we iterate on technology, the more it pencils out for us, the consumer, yeah. right? So think about how much your first computer was and think, how much the, think about the computers we carry in our, in our pockets today and what that is capable of doing relative to the first thing that we sent out in outer space, yeah. right? So... I think that we benefit, but I do hope that we could standardize on what a van, a minivan, <laughs> a truck and a car is in this industry. Do you agree with what I'm, you understand what I'm going with that? Completely agree. I just the, completely agree that it's gonna, it has to go that way. It's, it's probably, it's just the one area where it's not there, you know, kind of in the industry. And, and it, there's still a lot of debate. So the about next gen one's defined. I mean, it's not defined, it's being defined now. Yeah, yeah, it's being defined. Because, it, because, it's the first time, I mean, I got in this industry when we were building tier four data centers for banks. Remember those days where everything was two end? And then we were like, okay, well, we're not gonna, we'll do a distributed redundant one line with an N plus one topology on X, and we'll still sign it to an SLA, right? So there were certain things that I saw evolving. And I think this is interesting because it's the first time and it's being led by the hyperscalers too, but it's something that you saw already in Bitcoin mining facilities where, like you said earlier, which caught my attention is we're actually going backwards in what we're applying to next gen data centers from a hyperscale perspective for AI, yeah. because the density still don't reach what we do in Bitcoin mining, but the volume and velocity in Bitcoin mining will never reach what we're doing in AI. Exactly. So we're gonna have to find a better way to take those means and methods and standard practices that worked great yeah. and apply them to a data center industry that was once evolved like this. Hey man, uh, I know that data cloud you have, you're gonna need a UPS system. Why on earth would I ever need a UPS? Well, in case something goes down, you're gonna wanna have your generator start. Why do I need a generator? Now you're talking about how they need two UPSs or two yeah. whatever, and now you're telling them, hey, remember how we told you we needed UPSs or gens? We could probably live without those now. you know. And they're like, wait a second, we're like going backwards. But the reality is, is it's evolving through this curve right now. And you're seeing three different industries emerge. The Bitcoin mining data centers, the traditional traditional mining, or traditional data centers, and the oil and gas merging to the industry. That's like, wait a second, someone say they need power and they're trying to figure out how to solve for that when the grid won't. So it's really this merging of three big things. Do you agree with that? I agree. The you know, the, the power aspect that you brought up is, you know, it's probably the hottest button right now, right? It's supply chain. We talk about, you know, the cooling technologies and what we're doing inside the data centers, uh, right now, power is king and having power that is what I always refer to as near-term power. You, you see announcements around data center campuses is like, it's gonna be the world's largest two gigawatt data center campus finishes coming online in 2055, right? You, you see those types of announcements. Right now it's what power comes online in 26, right? 25 is done, I talk about this, like 
25 had to be settled a while ago. If yeah. you're going to be on in 25, you need to be building. You bought that stuff 50 yeah. months, uh, yeah. 50 weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and 26, you know, you're, you, you're going to need to get after it here pretty soon if you're going to have 26, you know, power built. And then, you know, 27 goes after that. So power that's available 26 and 27 is by far, I would say the most precious resource inside the industry right now. Um, and then you go back to the, all the supply chain pieces. Cause it's like, okay, great. I have, I have this many megawatts of power available in 26. Do I have any of my kits ordered? Right. Is anything, you know, is my supply chain solved? Because if you don't really have that solved, you're probably not getting that online in, in 26. But, um, but it is interesting for oil and gas. And then, you know, <laughs> it's been a, it's been a funny evolution for me in, in just like, as I've, I've gone through this and I think back over the last, you know, three and a half, four years, the, so Bitcoin was the most exciting thing to happen to the potentially the most boring industry in the world, electricity. Right. And it really it, did change the whole dynamic, for changed the game. And it was, and you would go to these conferences and, and these guys who are, you know, utility guys or, you know, electric guys so excited that you have this interruptible load, right? This curtailable, almost immediately curtailable load. It was, and especially like, Hey, I could take, you know, hundreds of megawatts of your power off of this location. And if you tell me to turn off, I'll be turned off in two minutes. Like that's, there's never been anything like that. Oh, uh, the frequency response, demand response. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but just the ability to, to use that amount of power and then turn it off and put it back in the grid if you needed to. So that was really exciting. And now there's a whole different level of excitement because when we were going around and finding power for, for Bitcoin facilities back in um, 21, right? The crackdown in China, like there's so many people looking in the US and, you know, I, I thought it was a frenzy then. It's like 10X, 20X that now for people really? looking for power. I mean, we, we talked to some of these utilities and we we're talking to one that their entire grid is five gigawatts. And um, already anyway, oversubscribed to it. No, they, they had had something when we talked to them and this was, six months ago, they had had uh, 15 gigawatts of requests from data center companies in the past eight months. Yeah. They're, they're running a grid that's five, you know, and they're not the only ones. So it was, it, it's going on everywhere. And so, um, which is, you know, one of the big advantages that, that our company has and what's kind of getting us into this space, what's helping us break through. Uh, but the power is definitely king. And it's just, what people are willing to do to solve for this. Like, I, I just love to watch. I love being involved in these discussions. Um, and, you know, people are being really innovative to kind of solve, solve that problem. Uh, but, but it's, it's pretty fun. And, it, and again, back to, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not trying to be offensive to all the data center companies out there, but, you know, probably the, one of the most second most boring industries is, you know, probably been data center for, you know, it's like you're building buildings and, and now you have this it's the best kept secret too. You can't talk about what you're building for, who you're building for. And now you're uh now you have just like this massive change, probably you know, bigger than when the hyperscalers initially went to the cloud because it just hit so fast, right? I think the whole industry just caught caught flat footed. And and we saw this early in the way, you know, we saw it in 23 and we we did a couple of things when we saw it in in the early part of 23 so we started doing this in 22 and then but in 23 when we saw early in 23 what was going on we kind of ran around and grabbed co-location space from you know some of the guys that are uh, that you would know in the industry and uh locked that up because we were doing the the gpu cloud business uh and you know that all got scooped up you know through through 23. And then we started going back and saying, you know, designing this much larger footprint. Um, but I'll, I'll remember in 23, when we were going and locking these things in, uh, I mean, these were, here's what I didn't appreciate. And I'll tell you what I didn't appreciate is, and you've you know been in this a lot longer than I have is we were doing Bitcoin. And so we did 500 megawatts, two years, and we were going to data center companies and saying, Hey, can I get 15 megawatts, 20 megawatts, and I need it all in the same, you know, location. Yes. Yeah. And, and can I get it right now? And like, I didn't realize that was a big number for them. They were like, Ooh, yeah, yeah. Who, who are you? Yeah. Right. Who, who are you and what are you using this for? And so I, uh, I had, you know, three CEOs of data center companies that you would know very well. 
we were, you know, talking to them about this. They all showed up in my office and, uh, is, is there swearing on this? <laughs> there is. So of course there is. So this is, I'm, I'm just, you know, giving a quote here, right. uh, but they would show up in my office. We'd sit down and they would basically go, Hey, what the fuck is going on? Sure. And, uh, cause like no one needed this. Like the, it was, you know, high ish power density, you know, call it 40 or 50 KW. And we're looking for huge amounts and we weren't the only ones. Right. And so they were seeing it, not just from us, but they're just, they wanted to know what was going on. And they like, I think the whole industry hadn't really figured this out yet. And so we, you know, started running as fast as we could at that point. Um, but it, it's been a funny, like a, a very fun evolution to watch. What were some of the biggest differences in like the Bitcoin side? Like what would be the minimum lease you needed to get your, to deploy capital for the product for the client? If you're going to build 500 megs at arbitrary, 100 megs what do they need like if you're doing 100 megs in the data center space you need a 10-year lease you know the 10-year mm -hmm. term or so i don't care this is a big difference um for bitcoin and it's kind of our roots and we'll feed into kind of how we're building our data center now but uh it doesn't matter what the the lease length is in bitcoin land because as soon as you lose that client you can put another one in no um a couple of reasons no matter how long the lease is, you're not getting financing for it. Yes. So that's why I was wondering, like, what do you need to get financing? You you, you don't get financing, right? So yeah. So we we actually did a good job getting, um, you know, loan to cost. We we got some mortgages on our spaces that were like, you know, ten fifteen million dollars on facility. The debt market. But, yeah. But but it was we we did it actually like North Dakota was amazing for this. So we had uh, local banks in North Dakota. And then North Dakota has. Um, the something called the Bank of North Dakota State Bank. This is think of it as like the SBA, but just for the state Basis of North Dakota. North it's, Dakota. An, it's an economic bank, and they come in and they um, guarantee loans for the local banks. You know, they, they for us they like kind of buy the rate down, so it helps us. You know, economic stimulation. It's they exactly want to bring what, businesses. It's up exactly there. what it is. So we we're able to get some some loans on our facilities in North Dakota. But the answer on Bitcoin is contract length, you know, it's fine. But at, at the end of the day, like everyone is, is going, well, what's the duration? Like how sustainable is this? It would be like, well, let's, let me do the comparison. So we, in our AI cloud business, like on our GPU business, when you're negotiating those and we, we negotiate what's called reserve contracts, which means take or pay, right? That they're, they owe you for every hour on that GPU, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, whether they're using it or not. And so those were the initial contracts we were signing there, but we're signing with, you know, AI labs and AI startup companies and the toggles for negotiating were, you know, how much will you pay me up front? Cause there's always prepays. And then, uh, what's the duration of the contract? And then, and that kind of determined the price. You had kind of a pricing curve, right. That went with that. But you'd have some of these companies that figured that out and they'd be like, well, let's do a five-year contract. And I'm like, I don't know if you're going to be here for six months. Like why, yeah, exactly. why, why am I going to give you five-year pricing? So Bitcoin's kind of similar in that, you know, no one knows the duration, right? And Cause they don't know how fast that, correct me if I'm wrong. There's really no way to understand the life of the technology that's doing the mining itself, right? And that's why it's really hard because that could be, they could burn that out in nine months, they could burn it out in 12, right? So it could, it, just like any technology for Bitcoin, it can, there's two things, uh, just back to the compute, anything running that amount of watts through it, it's going to burn out faster than something that's not right? right. It just, just generally the way it is. And because it's just, it's running hotter all sure. the time, even if you're cooling it well, it runs hotter. So you, you have that aspect, but the other aspect that's always out there, not just for Bitcoin mining, but for, um, for technology, if someone shows up with a new ASIC that is three times as efficient as the one that you have, you're done. Yeah. Like you're, it's going to become uneconomical in a short period of time for you to be operating in the network. So, so you have those two pieces and, you know, Bitmain has dominated that ecosystem for, um, you know, as, as long as I can remember, uh, you know, and they have kind of a cadence of, of introducing and, and you should, you know, we kind of think of these as three-year life. We generally sign, you know, three or five-year contracts with our customers. So we, we did get great contracts though. We had, um, you know, what, what I think is, we landed the best customer in that industry and that's uh marathon digital. Sure. And, uh, so, you know, Fred and I made that deal together and we went out and now, you know, they have, um, 
they're basically the hundred hundred percent. They're not quite. They're ninety percent customer for our, our Bitcoin business. We together with them, we help them. You know, grow into the largest uh, Bitcoin miner in the world. They do some of their own facilities now. Think of them as, you know, as you know, you both took a risk with each other. Yeah, you but, grew as you, as a team. And, and now, and now, Marathon is you know the Google or Microsoft or Amazon of that industry, and they're they're doing just what those hyperscalers did, which is, you know, hey, we're going to go own some of our own sites and we're going to, you know, vertically integrate that way. And we're still going to use external people and kind of make a, a balance there. Um, but, uh, but that, I mean, that was, that was a fortunate deal for us to get, to get Marathon. And then we, you know, we, we all grew together and, and they became the largest, you know, Bitcoin miner in the world. So, but, but even back to the original point, even with Marathon, and them being the largest in the world, there's no banks that want to finance this. So like kind of contract duration doesn't matter that much. So uh, you just had to get really creative in the way that you put together capital to go do these well, programs. It's, so you get creative and then again, back to, you know, the PubCo, right? The public company. And, uh, but the other part of it is uh, the cash on cash returns in that business are really different than like traditional data center or next gen data center, right? Where your your contact contract duration and the credit quality of your customer drive you know the return on capital down significantly. But um, but you you know we're getting cash payback on those in like two and a half years, right? And so like your your rate of return, building you know steel buildings that should last fifty years and you have some components burn out, but like yeah, but a line share of it's paid off in the first few years. That's fantastic. Yeah. And you, but I mean, this is, this is just the, you know, the financial way of life in general is, you know, we've all heard risk reward, like how many times you heard that in your life. So if you're taking a bigger risk, right, you should get a higher return on, on your dollars. And you, and we're seeing a lot of that in, in the AI ecosystem too, on, on kind of like the, what we call the next gen data centers, right? There's, there's just a wide variety of customers. And so if you're, depending on which customer, if you're, you, you can get paid more, you know, like a, on, on your return right now, you can get paid more and bet that that customer is going to make it, or you can, you know, get paid a lot less and go to the really stable customers that you know are going to be there. So there, there's, there's actually a really big spread in the industry right now, you know, based on that. Makes sense. So what were some of the other things that you were seeing on the data center, the traditional data center side that was taking shape that made you feel comfortable getting into the next gen data center side is because you saw the changes of infrastructure requirements shifting so so th this really started with um you know hey i want to want to diversify you know the business some not just bitcoin here are our assets what are we really good at really good at finding power we put these facilities online uh the one that looks similar to this is high performance computing niche market at the time, right? Yeah, you're, right? You're going after oil and gas companies. You're going after, you know- High ed. Just, yeah. Higher education is doing research. You you know, you're going after uh, like small automation design, right, so. but it's it's small, right? And so we, when we started, we said, I, I told the, our, what we call our, our, our e-dev team at the time, um, guys, we're going to do five, maybe 10, maybe 15 megawatt builds for this. This is what the market is. It'll diversify. They're they're much more expensive per megawatt to build. Uh, originally, you know, I've, I've gone through the evolution of hey, we can retrofit these Bitcoin facilities. To no, we can't. We need to build something you know different from the ground up. And so, but we did build something very different. So our first iteration was hey, we're going to build this. This is GPU based. This is generally it wasn't called training at the time, but you know, machine learning or something of that nature, modeling, and. Um, the, the biggest piece we're going to cut out here is backup gen, right? Because these, you know, even as you go into now that you do training, like you can, you can check mark and you can pause and things can turn off and they can turn back on. And so we did UPS for a soft landing, but we removed backup gen, which, you know, saves quite a bit of money per megawatt. So we started down that path, but we were going to build smaller scale because that's just where the market was. So this is the, the first half of 22. And then in October of 22, we... Uh, through a partnership with a company named Foundry, we put a software layer in place um, and we were going to run a cloud service out of our, our facility in North Dakota. And by December of 22, we were running that cloud service and it was, it was higher ed. Actually, those were the, those were the small customers in there and it was, you know, running and, and operating. And then, you know, chat GPT hits in uh, December 22, just, we all know the success there. And we didn't, million users in five days. Yeah. And, and, 
And we didn't really see the change until the H100 was introduced, right? H100, March of 23. And when that happened, we're out marketing our data center space, right? We're building these, you know, 50 KW racks on the data center. And it turns out that it was a good fit for, um, and we're running a cloud service. And, and so it was a great fit for the H100 server and close together, high power density, all of the things that we needed. And so we were still marketing the data center space and we were introduced into an AI lab that wanted a cloud service. So they wanted a GPU cloud service. So we'd own the GPUs, we'd operate it for them. They would, you know, do their, their model training on, on, uh, on our cloud, a company by the name of character AI had grown really nicely. You can still, you know, use it on your phone. It's a, it's a fun app, uh, downloaded on your, your iPhone and you, you What's basically it called again? So character. Character, character AI, yep. And you can download this app. This is your app? No, no, no. Okay. This is this is our customer's app. Okay. All right. And so you download this app and you, you know, you can talk to Elon Musk or you can talk to Napoleon Bonaparte, right? You can talk to anyone you want to, like any famous or historical character. But the 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 real thing that they were doing was you can create your own character. And so, you know, think of your AI boyfriend or girlfriend that you're kind of text chatting Creating back and forth for yourselves, with, yeah. but you're, you're having a conversation. And so you're like, you know, you're texting back and forth with, you know, your girlfriend or boyfriend or your friend, your AI friend, you're created the friend you created yourself all day long. Like this is the person you interact with. Um, so that was, that was the app grew really fast. Um, and, and so we, we started down the path with them and we're like, okay, we're going to deploy GPUs, signed up more customers for that. And, you know, it was, it was, it was a wild, wild time. Um, and, and then when I saw this and I saw what was going on, I went back to my real estate development team and I said, guys, we need to go back to building hundreds of megawatts, but of, of this, right? We need to go back to building hundreds of megawatts. And so that was in the, in the early part of 23. So call it May of 23, we did that. So through the summer of 23, our team worked on design. We didn't use the the first design we had because now we had a lot more knowledge base in this. Uh, we actually worked with um, NVIDIA has a you know data center design and engineering team. And a lot of people don't know that. They just know them for the GPUs. But Wade the, Vincent's coming to speak at DCMC. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, so they have a great team there and we worked with them. Some of the team at Cray uh, designed a new facility that was, uh, you know, it was actually focused on Blackwell. It wasn't called Blackwell at the time, but it was, you know, looking through to what kind of the next generation after the Hopper series was going to need. And so we, we went, did all that design, had it ready to go. Um, and then, you know, made the leap in October of last year where we said, Hey, you know what? we don't have a customer and you know we don't definitely don't have the all the capital to finish this we'll have to get new capital in but let's start building a 100 megawatt critical it load facility in ellendale north dakota in the middle of nowhere that seemed like a good idea perfect uh, place for <laughs> ai data centers and so so we started doing that um you know and fast forward you what know, was some of the things that made it most so creative obviously i was at lane was it capacity of natural gas was it uh at that site Okay. Yeah. What was it that made you pick that spot? So there was a site we already had for Bitcoin mining. Okay. Um, so what made that site attractive is even though it's a very small place, it, uh, it has, uh, a lot of fiber routes there. And so, I mean, you know, you need, you need connectivity. You need minimum, bare, bare minimum, two diverse routes on fiber, but you really need more than that. And so they, they have that at that location the power availability there. Um, so if, if you pulled up like a MISO grid map, you can see that location all the time. I don't know if you probably have never seen the MISO grid heat map and it'll show you what pricing is real time across the market. Well, this one, this, this node always sits at a deep purple color and that typically means negative, right? And so oftentimes we get paid to use electricity at that site. And why is that? It's because almost two gigawatts of wind power feed into the substation and that we're pulling off of. And there's not enough Demand. transmission capacity to take it out. There's not enough load there to use it because, uh, so, so going back to, to what our company does, right? Here's what we do extraordinarily well, find large amounts of low cost power. And the way that we find that is, uh, we call it stranded power. So stranded power is created in the US in two ways. So one of the ways, which is relevant to where we're sitting today, is a large power hungry industry 
goes out of business and leaves. Okay, so that's that's Rockdale, right? Rockdale's east of here. And so Rockdale, Texas, where there's a lot of Bitcoin mining, there was big, I think, Alcoa aluminum smelter there that's that right. got shut down. And so there was all this power that fed in there. Transmission, that, everything. everything. And then it's just, the, the load is gone. And so that's one way to find it. The other way is because of the, you know, the incentive programs in our country around renewables, um, you know, you're, people that develop renewable energy generation, you know, they're, they're pretty focused on the credits, right? The renewable energy credits. And that's a big part of the economic model there. And so if you're building wind, you want to go where the wind blows the most and the land is the cheapest so that you can generate the most credits for the least amount of dollars invested. And so you've had, you know, North Dakota is the sixth largest wind producing state in the nation. Texas is number one, right? And, um, the North Dakota is sixth largest in the nation. I think they're 48th or 49th in population. And so, you know, but the, the wind blows, the land is cheap. Uh, so on those, on those wind turbines, the operators there will run the grid to about negative $35 a megawatt hour before they curtail. So it's more profitable for them to pay someone 35 bucks a megawatt to take the electricity and they still get their credit, right? Um, and so that node runs negative pretty often, but we that's not the only place we found. So if you look at our three locations we had, we have, we have you know, two that are operating now, and we have one in Texas that we sold, they were all by wind farms, all of them. And so we, you know, it's it creates that. And now you, the, the limitation at our site in Ellendale, so, you know, it's kind of, I think we have 530 contracted megawatts there. We think that goes to 605 by 27. So utility power, uh, that turns into, you know, 400 megawatts of, of IT load. Um, the limitation there is, you know, wind doesn't yes, work for all windy this, every day. Right? Yeah. And so the, the base load is what matters for what the, the limitation is because we can get more wind to feed in there. Like people will put more wind farms up as we build, but, um, but yeah, that that's, so Ellendale, we had that. Is that the strategy for applied is to go to places where it's stranded and meaning that you could repurpose a distressed asset that has all the infrastructure there for generation or transmission and you can repurpose that? Are you finding certain areas better, like deregulated in mar you know, markets like Texas versus, I don't know what Idaho is like, but I'm sure it's pretty wild west up there. Uh, it, it's much less wild west than, than what really? Texas is. Uh, so Idaho is you know, mostly one utility across the entire state. And so, the, the lead times we've, we've looked, the lead times are high. I mean, I'd love to do something in my home state, but, um, the mostly in MISO is where we're finding it middle of the country. Are you, you know, seeing Wyoming? Uh, we haven't been in Wyoming, you know, the, not as much. I mean, a lot of that. So Wyoming became a hyperscale area mm -hmm. already, and there's not, you know, I have to go back and remember this because we've looked through all the States and I'm not our power guy. We have a great one, but, uh, for, to my recollection, there's just not enough power being generated in that state, you know? And so like North Dakota is fantastic. It, it, it's really great. So they generate over double the amount of power in the state versus what they use. Plus the they have massive natural gas. Uh, Nat gas, yeah. you know, oil, they, they have lignite, right? The, the Fracking stuff. Yeah. And everything. Um, and, and then just the, you know, like I said, sixth largest wind producing state in the nation. So they produce over double the amount that they use. now. That's, that sounds fantastic and it is fantastic. However, when you think about the scale of what we're doing, that's a, that's a five gigawatt state, right? And we already have, you know, 700, 800 megawatts in that state. And then we have some down in South Dakota that put us, you know, north of a gigawatt right there. Like, how much more can you get? Uh, right. I mean, it's, you, you've, we're already locking up, you know, close to 18%, uh, like, that, that's the issue with states like, like that and with Wyoming. Fantastic states to operate in, but when you're looking at this type of scale- There's limitations. There's, there's limitations, right? Texas, 90 gigawatt market. So very different. And I mean, with the way that it's deregulated, there's a lot of, um, there was a Goldman Sachs report. I'm sure you saw the one that came out a few months ago. It was June or July, I think. And it talked about how, you know, 27 gigs or 60% of the power that needs to be on the grid in the next five and a half years, approximately 45 gigs total, 60% or 27 gigs of that total is going to come from natural gas. The other three elements are really solar, 
wind and other right maybe yeah. fuel cells something i don't know but it'll be not as big as solar and wind there's so much going on in texas right now that there's multiple programs within here in nevada wyoming that all those programs that i'm talking about that i were talking to people about start with a g they're yeah. not megawatt campuses they're all gigawatt campuses and it sounds like a lot of it will be natural gas as a primary and the utility well, I mean, they'll use diesel as a backup till utility gets there to be the backup, you yep. know? So they may never take that into the utility provider. That may always be prime generation natural gas. So the that's the one thing that over the past, you know, six months, I've really started to hear a lot more about mm -hmm. is just off grid. We're going to build the gen and we're going to build the data center. And it typically is not typically every single time I've heard of it, it's Nat Gas. Uh, and I'm sure as we go at some point in the future, you know, you're going to start to hear about like uh, small modular nuclear reactors SMRs, that, they'll, yeah. that they'll do this with. Uh, I think that's five plus years out, right? I think Just about get, right, five yeah. to seven. So to, to get that done. But uh, I've, I definitely, we're seeing and hearing a lot about, we haven't seen anything kick off, you know, and kind of where we operate, but we've been hearing about you know, crazy CapEx, you know, projects that are between the gen and the DC capacity, not including the equipment and, you know, not inc including the compute that are, you know, we've heard a hundred, a hundred billion dollars, right? Like a, a single project. And I'm like, wow, it's insane. Well, the think about it in, in insanity, the pull through rate years ago, when I was at HP or EYP, I remember the best part about being at HP at that time was the access to so much aggregate information regarding yeah. technology itself. And the pull through rate was estimated on the MEP side. So we're building space power and cooling modules that are filled with IT. The pull through rate was at that time one to 10, meaning for every dollar you spent on the data center, you spent $10 on the infrastructure inside yeah. of it. So, you know, overall the total data center cost 90 cents for every dollar is traditionally spent on the CapEx side of that business, right? If not more. And now you're saying that that is nothing in comparison to the bigger picture, right? So it's, I mean, you're still, look, uh, if I if I look at our facility, you know, if we just assume NVIDIA is, here, is going in there, a billion dollar building probably has three to $4 billion worth of, of uh, compute. Oh, I was gonna think it would be double that. You know, because the dense, like think about some of these racks and yeah. the dense, I mean, I remember seeing the first million dollar rack I've ever seen. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, that's a million dollars. That's With, all you need is uh, four H100 servers in there. And, and there you are. And there you are, right? But what I'm saying is, I remember when the people were complaining because those racks cost $150,000 a piece, yeah. be careful, yeah. right? And those are banks that we were building for. And now yeah. they're a million dollars a rack. So you're like, well, we know that the, we could probably put, I don't know, how many racks we put in one of those facilities for a hundred megawatts. A lot is the yeah. answer, yeah. right? So there's, it's gotta be a lot more than for a billion dollars of CapEx deployed on the infrastructure on the MEP side, you're deploying five to 10 X yeah. that on the IT infrastructure yeah. side. Yeah, you're right. Um, but the, yeah, and the the rack cost is, uh, I haven't gone through the Blackwell piece yet, but you know, it's gonna go up and not, not down the, the, that. Which is unusual for commodities. Yeah, you, you, you're, I think your price per flop is gonna go down, but you know, the, the because of the, the amount of flops coming out of the rack, the price of the rack is gonna go up, right? And I so- think it's, I think it's because uh, it, the cloud, the AI compute, you know, the sky for the cloud or the home for AI, whatever that is, the data center is itself is gonna be sold as a utility. So it's gonna be, I mean, we're buying it as a utility. Yeah. We have phones that we pay monthly subscriptions for cloud services, for storage, blah, blah, blah. But I think it's the whole economic stream gets kind of locked in and it starts evolving heavily in the next two quarters. I mean, I'm not sure what you're seeing, but that's the tea leaves that I get to read based on where I get to sit. I'm not sure what you have access to. Yeah, I mean, one of the, from a, on our side, yes, right? Like we get a nice long-term contract. Now this has got to flow through all the way to the end user at some point, right? I think one of the, so we see the popularity of ChatGPT. We see Gemini now in Google, right? If you just go use, or you use your, uh, you know, your Microsoft browser, you'll, you'll see the AI tool yeah. there, you know? Safari and, has one too, and, yeah. And so, and then, 
you know, cu really curious to see the AI assistant that comes on the iPhone, right? When that shows up, sounds like, uh, I think the latest I heard is delayed a little bit, but, um, we're not talking about a lot of AI out of Amazon just yet though. Right. So, I'm I mean, you have anthropic basically, right. Um, but you're not seeing it in there. Like I, well, I personally don't use like an Alexa or so, so maybe there's you know, something there, but like with, you know, meta has so far, I think, been the biggest proof point of money generation out of AI, right? So if you looked at Meta on their last quarterly earnings call, they attributed their accelerating growth, the outperformance of what they're doing versus the, the overall ad industry uh, directly to their AI efforts, right? And so you're seeing a big uplift. So you're seeing that payoff for them. And what does that mean? You know, in the case of Meta, there's a lot of, like you can get on your, you know, Instagram or I, I don't have Facebook, but you get on those, um, and you see the, the little AI assistant tool on there and you can ask it things, but, uh, but they're using theirs for ad targeting, right? It's making their products smarter because that's yeah. their, that's their product, right? Their product is ad targeting and their ad targeting used to be the best, the best in the business. But then, you know, Apple smashed them when they let people choose to stop sharing information, you know, from all their apps into one app. And so like that, that's when, you know, Meta, if you just wanted to go look at a stock chart, right, that's when they had a, a struggle because all the information that they were gathering from everyone just got cut by, you know, 90 plus percent. And so now they're using AI tools to, to do that retargeting. So there's, you know, really obvious success already for Meta. And you know, I, I think it's yet to be seen. We're still waiting for, you know, uptake of of Copilot uh, and those types of things. Uh, but we, but eventually, we need to see you know revenue and business cases come out of yeah, all of this because uh, because where we sit on our side, right? Like this infrastructure build is exciting and it's crazy and it's fun, um, stressful. Uh, but the that all you know. For this to not be, you know, the web 2.0 blow up, right? Revenue generation has to come out of it, but the early signs are really strong and at scale, right? Meta's at scale. This is not like, hey, Meta realized, you know, 1% of their revenue, you know, they're attributing the growth to what they're doing on on uh, on AI. And then if we see, you know, Copilot uptake, you know, Gemini, I, th I think on the search companies though, they're they're just kind of, you know, that maybe they're just more stuck with a, a potentially over the future, a higher, uh, you know, cost of goods, just that they'll have to have this to compete in search and maybe it won't actually generate more revenue for them. Um, so you could have some of those. They buy the relevancy. I mean, look, I'm not trivializing meta at all, but they did buy, you know, WhatsApp or Instagram or blah, I mean, but that's normal where there's a consolidation and aggregation of, of things. And then, um, they're going to consume companies that have uh, patents or advancements on something. And that's how they iterate. Don't you think? Yeah. It's been that way for a while, but, but we, we are, I'm excited that we're starting to see, you know, the, that meta earnings report was for me important for the industry. And I, I think that kind of went, you know, I wouldn't say largely unnoticed, but kind of unnoticed in that, you know, not a lot of people are thinking about that, but they're investing so heavily on the AI side. Um, you know, they're, they're one of the big, you know, data center consumers as well. So, um, but the, it'll be interesting, you know, not, not getting too far away from our business, but these things all matter, but like what happens in the industry. So we're, you and I were talking, you know, we're the guys putting the foundation in place. We're, you know, the arms dealer, right? The picks and shovels guys were the ones that provide the infrastructure to make this work. And then you, you layer up to NVIDIA, who's, you know, really doing this, um, you know, making this work and, and you, you know, you go back to the, uh, the invention of the, the transformer, right? Then not, not we're, we're data center guys. So transformer, not the electrical transformer, the transformer, which is, you know, the, the software engine, which makes generative AI possible. Uh, so, you know, that piece, you know, will, you know, is kind of the flux capacitor of, of gen AI. Right. And, uh, so you have that and you have all of this amazing stuff going on and it's accelerating so fast. Like the things that we may see over the next couple of years, 
there could be some scary things that we would see, right? Like not, not scary in a bad way, right? So there's a company right here in Austin, uh, the, the, uh, not just Tesla, but there's another uh, humanoid company here in, in Austin. Is it uh, Aptronic maybe is the name of the company? So there's a few companies that have humanoids that are, um, you know, mechanically very advanced. The, the piece on the humanoid that is left is the brain, right? And Gen AI is going to be the part that, that fixes that. So these things have, you know, initially go to warehouses, right? Warehouse work, factory workers, these types of things. And they're getting the cost curve down to where, you know, if they if the Gen AI works and they can get the productivity of these up, you're gonna see that crossover of like human, you know, humanoid cost where it goes down. And then the humanoid cost is just gonna keep going down like technology does. Well, you know, the human cost just keeps going up. And so you see those introduced. I think that'll be one of the, what I call the scariest things for people is when you see things that look like people walking, walking around. around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I don't care if they're delivering your Amazon boxes or whatever, it's going to be a little bit shocking. Where the ethics yeah. and governance behind those yeah. are at for yeah. sure. I like, what else are you seeing? Like, I, I want to, I want to, maybe we'll pivot back to something real quick to, cause I want to walk into the future a little bit now, now that people got to hear who you are, let's, I want to summarize or give an overview, you know, because we unpackaged a lot of stuff about Applied Digital, right? How you became the group you guys are and what you're all about. But if there are people that are listening, there's one sound bite. like what are the top three things about Applied Digital that you'd want them to remember before we pivot into the next part of the industry? Look, okay, we, you know, we, we're, we're out in front of, of this, right? I think we've, you know, the company has assembled the team that is, you know, will be one of the leaders for this next generation digital infrastructure. Um, we, you know, we have large scale facilities. We're out, I mentioned, you know, publicly uh, a few days ago, right? We're, we have our Ellendale facility, but then we have three other campuses for 26 power. I mentioned earlier, it's time to market 26 power that we're marketing that the total uh, 1.4 gigawatts. Um, but we, you know, we've been, ahead of the curve here. It's been, we're, we're a really dynamic company. It's been fun. It's been stressful, but the, we have a, a fantastic team that we keep building out, right? We've hired some really key industry veterans. So it's going from just being, you know, kind of let's make it work to let's make it work correctly all the time. Like in, in the, cause, cause the, the standards are so much higher as we step up from, you know, from big, from a reliability yeah, yeah, just, and so for us, I think, I think we're, a, a you know a pioneer in next generation digital infrastructure. Uh, I I think that we have you know one of the best teams in place to go out and and uh, put this you know these facilities in place for for our customers. And then lastly, I think we're we're just a really creative and innovative company that solves problems. I mean, it, you're, you're a business owner too. And I always tell people, they're like, what, you know, what's the biggest part? You obviously need to have a vision. You need to have all of these things and execution and the right people. But at the end of the day, problem solving is probably the number one skill for, for, um, you know, entrepreneur or business owner is problem solving. And so, uh, I think our company as a whole, like if our customer has a problem, we're, we're really creative and we work aggressively to, to make it happen. And I think that, you know, that's been, you know, the mantra for me at the company for our employees is like, we make stuff happen, right? That's, that's what we do at the end of the day, we make it happen. We find a way, you know, and there's challenges everywhere, especially as you're, you know, building this kind of scale, even when we, before we we're building big scale, but, um, you know, we just, we always found a way and you just get a million roadblocks and, I think the the fact that we solve problems like that now, especially now, because our all of the companies in this space, our customers, potential customers, what they need is they need capacity and they need it yesterday. Yeah. Right. And, and so as cheap as they can get it. Yeah. Yeah. And and so problem solving is key. And I just think we have an extremely dynamic team that that uh does that extraordinarily well. No, that's awesome. And you could tell that you are radiating with pride and passion on your team. <laughs> Look, not every CEO gets to do that, right? So uh, it's, it's been a journey and, uh, yeah, but there, we, we do have a fantastic team and we just keep pulling them in. So how long have you, would you say that you, when the time that you reinvent and reinvented yourself, like I'm a five-year-old startup or I'm coming up on my five, my fifth year anniversary is 11-1. So I'm close to it. Right. So, um, 
when you reinvented yourself, doesn't matter how long Applied Digital was around or what it was before that, but when you reinvented and pivoted the ship on a new course, was that three years ago, five years ago, seven years ago? What are you thinking? So the so we we've we've pivoted twice as a company and our company will be coming up on our four year anniversary here in nice. about uh six months. Uh so, <laughs> you getting there? So uh still white knuckling it. Yeah, but you know, um the the first big this 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 is back to you know problem solving and and the pivot. So we start the company, we're going to deploy large scale GPUs. Um, and we're going after these, and this comes from kind of like the asset manager, like the financial background for me. So, you know, in, in crypto, there's these proof of work networks that are GPU based, Ethereum being the largest by far. And now it, that's moved over to proof of stake. So it's not there anymore, but there was 10 others, call it maybe, maybe 12. And we were scaling, going to scale out GPUs and you could just, instead of allocating dollars into an investment, you could just allocate compute to these networks and then collect your tokens. Right. And, um, and so that was, that was the idea, large scale. And we formed a partnership with the largest Ethereum pool miner in the world, um, at the time that 25% of the hash rate. So this, this is how we got started, but everything was in China and we were going into China. All right. So this is April of 21. And in the, I don't remember if it was May 27th, May 28th. I remember it was going into Memorial Day weekend. And um, Friday, news comes through, China's banning all crypto mining. We had- Why was that, by the way? You might, I mean, can I you can, educate us on that just sure, for a minute? Sure. So you can have your, everyone can have their own opinion on this. So I'm giving you my yeah. opinion. Okay. So China is a restricted currency country, right? You- if you're Chinese, you can't take your money out of China, right? Like, so it's it's restricted currency. And so while the government may restrict you from um, taking, you know, your RMB and turning it into euros or into dollars, what they couldn't, what they didn't restrict you from doing was taking your RMB, your, your yuan, and turning it into GPUs or ASICs, right? And so you turn it into GPUs or you turn it into ASICs, and then you mine crypto tokens, right? And so then you get these crypto tokens in a crypto wallet, and then you have the, you know- The, the currency they can't track. The, a, a currency they can't track. You have uh, something that's borderless, trustless, like all the great things. And I know for, for people that don't know crypto, like trustless is a good thing, not a bad thing. And it sounds like a bad thing, but that, that means that this transaction is going to happen and you don't have to know the other party. You don't have to trust them and you know the transaction secure, right? So you you have all the benefits of what you just call it Bitcoin is. And then uh, you know, you you have a country where, you know, I think a lot of the citizens of that country don't really feel like they own things. Right? You know, we we have a very Western mindset. And so well, they have a capitalistic economy, but they have a communist society. So correct. it's a little bit challenging. Yep. But but you know, I think there's plenty of examples there where it's like people get wealthy and then they're not, you know? And so, so it's, uh, I mean, look, look at, uh, Alibaba, right. The, the founder there, but the, um, so things that can't be confiscated, right. Uh, even more so than gold, like Bitcoin is going to be really hard for someone to confiscate from you. And so you had a culture there that was, that really bought into the Bitcoin standard. And so if they could take their their yuan or their RMB and and change it into ASICs and pay for power and get Bitcoin out of that, right? That went into this wallet that could be transferred anywhere. That it was that's that's why my this is again just that, my you opinion. think that's why China shut down the lack of control they have over the and then and then so that's why it got so big in China, but then that's also why it was shut, shut down. down. So the mining itself, what happened to the well that whole other subject? We'll talk about that another time, maybe, but um I don't know how I put a pin on that one and I didn't want really to pull you off your, your role, but we were talking before that about where you see the industry going right now. And, and we're both very bullish on this gold rush that we're talking about. Right. And give us, if you can, what are some of the things that are most optimistic for you about the trends that you're seeing in the industry today? As you're, you kind of didn't start on the outside looking in, you were in a parallel or an adjacent industry to ours that was doing things very similar to us. And we speak in the same terms. We speak about megawatts. We speak, of, we sell product in the form of power. We, you know, what we sell is in the form of power. It's not in the, I'm on, you know, it's a real estate play. It's not in the form of real estate at all, right? So, yeah. so what are you seeing now that you're kind of uh, 
getting more woven into everything that's quote unquote traditional? Yeah. Um, I mean, right now it feels like unlimited demand, right? Which never is the case, but it, it feels like that. I mean, you, like you said, you were in, in can earlier this year and I was like, everyone's head was just, you know, spinning, uh, on this and it just, you know, so for us, like I'm, I'm very focused on, you know, obviously it was on 25 power and now 26 and 27. And it just right now feels like anything you can bring online at scale through 27, you, you're going to sell. Right. And so that's, I don't see the industry really slowing in any way, or maybe even accelerating, but you can't, it's so hard to tell is the, is the problem because there's such a constraint, right? There's just a massive constraint in the industry. And so, you know, you, you have to start looking in the out years, like how, you know, how much demand is there for 28 power, right? And 29, but it's, it, it's just so hard to, to think, figure that out that right that now. That pressure though will change what the product is. I think that that's what forced, like knowing that it takes an extra arbitrary now a year to get to your engines. Yeah. Maybe we can figure out a design that doesn't require engines. Let's get a little bit more creative on the network topology. So we have metroactive replication or something else yeah. that makes it to where the, if that goes down, I don't need that engine anyway. And I, cause I get all replicated into the other facility. I don't know what it is, but there's going to be, um, what do they say? Necessity is the mother of creativity. Yeah, absolutely. So we are getting to the point where I think that the tail wags, the dogs, the engine providers specifically are probably the biggest pole to critical path. Do you agree? I agree. And, um, and we're getting to the point where we'll find a solution around even them. Like there will be bridging power that's necessary. We will need at least 27 gigs in the next five and a half years to support that. We will go from 3% of demand of a nation's energy source from one vertical of industry to nine to 10 in the next three or in the next five and a half years. If we can find the power, if we can get it, if the supply chain can, can support it, right? Like what's the alternative? Th we either design a less reliable, less efficient product for people to use, knowing that they're going to, it's going to shut off and turn off on them. Or we just as consumers find a, a place in which we're like, well, you know what? I didn't really need it that bad anyway. We maybe create healthier, more harmonious habits with machines and technology where we don't use it as much. <laughs> I don't think we're going back to um, the pre-internet days as much as we might like to, but the, um, you know, it, it could just slow. So here's the the downside of that. It could just slow, you know, development, right? The, the compute is the R&D at this point. Um, that's That's been the big change here, right? Is the, you know, the compute not only it, it used to be you use the compute to run the software, now the compute's writing the software, right? As, as, as uh, Jensen, the, the CEO of NVIDIA talks about. So it, you could just slow development, but I, you know, I've, I've had a lot of these conversations and we have a lot, you know, cause we do these things in small towns and you, know, which is one of the more unique things that we should, we should delve into a little bit, especially given my background. Um, the, it, but it's, you know, you putting these big projects in places, you start to get people to push back, but it's really important that we win, that the US wins in AI. And right now infrastructure is the enabler for, for this, right? More, the more infrastructure, the more you can enable this. And so, but it's important that our country wins. I think this is probably the most important technology race, you know, almost like the, you know, the, the, the nuclear, race we had, the nuclear arms race we had, but technology has become that new arms race. And it, it started, you know, back at the internet and it's just accelerating. And so it's extremely important. And you can see how important it is that we win, right? The, the, even the government has already restricted, you know, a lot of the GPUs that can be shipped, almost all the, the, the really high powered GPUs from NVIDIA or AMD are restricted from being shipped to China and, and to certain other countries as well. So that should signal to people how important it is that the US win in this technology race. And to do that, we got to put all this infrastructure in place. So I think it's going to happen, right? The, again, I'll go, I'll go back to the biggest gating item is availability of power. So, and then, and then you go to supply chain, power gen is definitely one. That one, I think is as crazy as, as it may sound to people that have been in the industry for a long time. I think that's probably the first one to go, right? Cause you don't actually need it to run. Like you, you know, you're going to have to have the cooling, you, you have to have the power, but you know, if, if you go to, you know, 
three nines versus five nines. Like- That's straight utility. Yep. But I hear you. I mean, like, I agree. I think that the ones that are making it so, so you, you have a very interesting thing that you mentioned, like we are in an arms race. It's a technology arms race. And, um, let's talk about America's, I mean, we're back to back world war champs. We talk about it in jokes, but <laughs> we talk about what we've done in each industrial revolution. The first industrial revolution was, you know, uh, it was a, is a steam engine which mechanized our ships, which allowed logistics, transportation, and shipping to be easier to come by, which also allowed us to create a locomotive train, which allowed us to transform the West. How do you think the 49ers got to the West Coast yeah. to pan for gold if it wasn't for a train, right? And 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 then the second industrial revolution, we introduced electricity, AC and DC power, as well as the adoption of a combustion engine into an automobile. Again, coming from America, right? And the third, well, we did split the atom through the creation of fission, which allowed us to create nuclear energy, fission and fusion, as well as hydrogen. But the reality is, is in the third industrial revolution, we created the, gen- the, the, the genesis of AI, which is the first real mainframe of computing. The very first data center ever created in, in Earth was in 1945 at the University of Pennsylvania. And it was designed by and funded for the US government for national defense and intelligence in World War II. Technology's always been, if you look at what technology was in the first industrial revolution, it's the adoption of the telegram, which gave Abe Lincoln, uh, it revolutionized warfare by having Abe Lincoln have access to his generals on the front line to determine how to win a war, right? So technology's always been a part of national security. Mike Sorelli, he's um, CEO of the Town War Group. He hosts a podcast called The Everyday Warrior on Men's Journal. And he and I are teaming up on a documentary about the birth of the data center industry right now. A lot of the content we make on these podcasts will be a part of it. But but what we're doing is we're really addressing it from national security. Even if you look at, uh, look at Facebook, look at Apple, look at Microsoft and Google and Amazon. FAMGA represent 80% of the capital deployed in our industry probably. They all started in America, as did the internet of things through amazon.com or you know bill gates's computers or steve jobs's computers but we are at the front end of technology have been since the beginning from the time we split the atom from the time we made a, a motor steam engine and everything that we're doing now we need to maintain our dominance and have peace through power and peace through dominance because right now there's a world war three is underway it's in space which is why we created spacex because it's where a lot of the technology resides and i think that you're right we have to maintain this because a lot of people will argue that what oppenheimer did in between the second and third industrial revolution while we went through world war one prohibition the depression world war two korea and vietnam is we did split the atom and we used and exercised those weapons as a deterrence to ever be used again and they've never been used again in combat they've been tested thousands of times which i think we all agree we don't need that but we have to have a shift to nuclear energy in the long term because the amount of growth the aggregate demand of the surge of emerging technology outpaces the capacity for us to deliver power unless we shift to another economy and use natural gas solar uh, wind and any other renewables is a bridging power to that next generation. I think every industrial revolution has had one key theme and that's power. And as we enter the fifth industrial revolution, which is what we're in right now, I think that the needs for technology, what we're doing on data centers will one, give the data center providers like you the opportunity to go into these small towns and create an on-ramp to the cloud and, 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 and create a business or an economy of technology that was once only nothing but agriculture, right? And I think that it'll also allow us to go into distressed markets throughout the United States where other economies may have faltered and we can repurpose those distressed assets and have an impact on community by creating more technology that changes humanity because it, it the technology demand itself will trigger the, a shift from energy, from what we use today to nuclear. And I think that that's the only way we get to the carbon footprint reduction we're really trying to get to. Yeah. What do you think? I, I think you are completely spot on with all of that. And I, the the only piece I would add is, you know, we talked a little bit about this earlier about what we do and these stranded power assets. So the only, the, the thing that I see getting us to that. So we're going after these stranded power assets and there's for near term out there for the next five and a half years. Yep. It's low so hanging fruit. You have to use those to get to you know nuclear but i i 
couldn't agree more that nuclear is the future. Uh, you know, it, we're here talking about the data center industry, but just in general, right? Wow. And so, um, it, it's very clear. It's just you know, unfortunately, there was some some setbacks, you know, uh, in the in the recent decade on that, and some countries, Fukushima, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I think- and and some countries just shut down all their their nuclear plants, which was you know clearly a mistake in hindsight. Um, so, but that has to come back, right? And and whether it's SMR is probably the way it goes. You know, the the large production plants uh, that we we've seen historically, um, but it, it's the, it's the only way to to solve this. You know, the I think France is probably percentage wise the most. Uh, I think the Nordic states are up there yeah. too. Uh, look, you're right. You're you're spot on. Like we've. There's been a lot of propaganda too. I mean, Greenpeace or Sierra Club. But have you ever heard of uh, Oliver Stone did a, sh- a Apple TV movie called Nuclear Now? Have you seen it? I have not. I encourage everybody that's listening to this podcast to go watch it. If you went to public school on the West Coast like I did, you got to watch yeah. it twice, right? <laughs> but I'll tell you, it really does a great job of bifurcating the dichotomy between nuclear weapons and nuclear energy. Yeah. And at some point, you know, we're getting ready to do a podcast campaign that'll roll out after DCAC that's called The Road to Nuclear. And we're trying to get Oliver Stone on the podcast to talk about it. But there's already, I mean, Amazon bought the Cumulus Data Center product up in Pennsylvania. And that's just, watch, that's going to be a standard, right? And you're going to see people like Quantum Loophole doing standard hyperscale master plan, thousand acre campuses that will be able to support you going in there or a line going in there right next to a Meta or a Google or a EIEIO, right? Yep. But these shifts are coming. We get to sit at the front row because it's all taking shape now. I feel like we're working in an industry that's emerging to become mainstream one day. And we're working amongst the Henry Fords of our industry. That's how I feel. I, I love that uh, analogy that, you know, uh, because I'm, I, I'm the newcomer to the industry, it's, it's a very... It's a very funny and fun industry. It's small, like you know, it's like, industrial. Yeah, it, it's it's like it, you know, like the the gossip. You know, everyone oh, yeah. kind of knows everything. It's just like the amount of capital that's deployed in the industry, like massive Ridiculous. amounts of capital, and uh, and then just like kind of everyone knows each other too. It's just it's a it's a really unique. I've never really ran into anything. It, you see this, you know, you kind of at high levels in you know certain semiconductor companies or comms companies, but uh, but yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a pretty cool industry with a with a, a very interesting and smart group of people. What do you um as we get closer to you know bringing this podcast home? Let's shift gears. You were saying something you're like, you're really, it seems like the small town um, place that you come from Mm. is near and dear to your heart still. And you want to continue to go into underserved markets like that and, and, and offer the ability to have technology um, engines that serve as the sky for the cloud and the home for AI is a part of their local economy. Yeah. I, I, I think one of the most unique things about, you know, we keep talking about next gen digital infrastructure, right? Next gen data centers. I think one of the most unique things is location. And we talked about kind of the latency aspects and you just have a little more flexibility around latency. And, you know, this is, this is a great thing, you know, like that even, you know, NVIDIA is participating in this, right? With what, what they've made and kind of their leadership on the hardware side here, that's really enabling this industry. And then, the the real innovators at the labs but you know they're they're not focused on this but what we have found is you know this this way to take these you know capex projects and and our our capex project i i believe will you know by far be the largest in the history of the state of north dakota right in ellendale right when you add in the the compute that's oh, going yeah. into it as well um so when when I think about it from my background, you know, grew up in a town of 200 people, you know, everybody knew each other. Um, but, and I, and I go back to, you know, I was a kid on a farm and I, and I said, the one thing I don't want to do is farm when I, when I get older, that was my one option, right? That was it. That was it for me. And so if I didn't want to farm, I had to leave. And so to be able to bring something back into the same type of town Love for it. me, and to create these opportunities and to create high paying jobs and to create, you know, in Ellendale, look, th- this is, this is something that I never thought I would be doing, but, um, we're, 
we're partnered with a developer to help build houses, right? And we're working on daycare. We're working on, you know, medical care. We're working on, you know, a lot of the infrastructure for this town. It's, it's a thousand people, right? It's a, it's a thousand people. And we've, you know, we've the, you, you can see a lot of press about us in, in kind of local North Dakota, um, you know, newspapers and even in the Dickey County Register, which is, you know, the, the newspaper for Ellendale. And, you know, we, you'll see a lot of positive things about us, but we really try to integrate into the community and we want to improve the community. And a lot of the people are excited. We had people that, um, you know, that, that lived in, you know, a guy that lived in Colorado, Jerry, who's our our, uh, ele- our master electrician on site in Ellendale. And he, he moved back from Colorado to Ellendale. He's from Ellendale, but, but he didn't have... You know, Job opportunity. Now like, go and, home. and and people are like, our kids can, you know, stay here. Our families can all grow up together. And so it's just, it's a unique thing to be able to bring to an area to help build a town, build an economy, build a community. And you have to do it, you know, it, you have to, you have to do it in the right way. You, you have to do it. And you're always going to have a few people to get mad, right? There's just no way to avoid that. You can give everyone in that city a bucket of gold. People will complain about how heavy it is. You know what I'm saying? Someone will get mad, but for the most part, the reception has been fantastic. And you need, in places like that, you need the community behind you. Yeah. You, you, if you're trying to just, you know, run people over, that's not what it is. But because, you know, my background and, and uh, it's actually my brother goes and does this. So my brother was like our first North Dakota employee. He lived in Idaho. And when we got our first site in North Dakota, we were doing Bitcoin mining up there. I was like, we have it. We were excited and we're just trying to get people to go there. And I couldn't get anyone to go. So I called my brother and I said, hey, I need a favor. I need, I need you to go. And so he went and he's like, well, I'll do it for a few months where we're, you know, getting close to four years later now. So, um, the, but he knows what this is like too. And so he does a lot of the community relations. Um, but just the fact that the way this technology is evolving and it's not rural America gets left behind now. It's like, no, 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 this, this, everyone can benefit here. It's not just building, you know, data centers and population hubs so that we can all watch Netflix. But, uh, so I, I just think that's one of the most unique things about, you know, the, this next generation of technology that is going to be great for smaller communities. Um, you know, and, and, and just that, that economic piece, it's not just Ellendale, North Dakota, right? It's, it's going to be a, you know, a, a big radius around there that, that gets the positive impact. Um, but uh, clearly near and dear to my heart that we're able to do that. And I, I just love the fact that, you know, for me, kind of it's coming full circle from where I grew up and now what we're doing and kind of taking something pretty crazy back into, you know, a, a place just like where I grew up. Listen, I lived in North Dakota for five years. I always say that my dad was incarcerated in my not North Dakota at Air Force, at that Air Force, at that Air Force base. I lived there for five years and I didn't know any better. I loved it, but it was cold. It's brutally cold, right? You, you can't even explain. <laughs> yeah. You can't, you have to feel it. You can't explain how cold that is. Yeah. We, we took a flight. Uh, I was there in December, two years ago, took a flight out of Bismarck uh, to come back to Dallas to go home. And uh, they had to push the aircraft back in and put heaters on the engine so that they could start to spin, heat the oil up. Yeah. And then we take off and they told us that uh, we have to wait 30 minutes to use the lavatory because it was frozen. Uh, you know, it's, just, it's, it's yeah. hard to explain. Hard That's to explain. a hard place. That's why we host uh, the far, the rest the our nationals for wrestling is in Fargo. Yeah. And I think they were like, let's just make it one of the places that you have to be harder and cough and nail to be able to survive in. You know? the, I will tell you the, like the people there are just, they're tough. They're resilient. Mm-hmm. Like we have built through three winters. Like we've done construction through three winters Tundra. there. And I mean, people go to work, you know, they, they go to work outside. Like it is, it's just, it's so impressive. Yeah. It's so impressive. So last thing, what do you tell people you do for a living? <laughs> uh, it, uh, depends on who I'm talking to, but, um, you know, I, f- for my kids, I, I talk about the apps that we enable, right. And I, you know, explain, explain what it is that we do, but, but, you know, I, I tell people, we did, you know, that we're a next generation digital infrastructure company. We are building, you know, the, the infra that makes a, a new industry run, right. We're, we're the ground floor, we're the foundation. And that, and we were talking about this earlier. I love that about our industry, right? I think we all are innovative and everyone's hardworking and we really are the bricks and mortar that make this operate. Um, 
but when I, I try to make it sound a little cooler to my kids, you know, yeah. uh, they'll say, Hey, you know, we run in stuff like chat GPT or, you know, here's, here's my customer's character. And they're like, I know character. Uh, so it's, uh, I, I tailor it a little bit to the audience, but at the end of the day, we're just putting the building blocks in place that allow people to go and do great things. You're right? still a farmer. You're just <laughs> not, you're not building, like you're you're still just planting seeds and cultivating things to take root. And it's just an infrastructure plaque yeah. instead of a potato, right? But I, I love what we do. I love this industry, sky's the limit. And I mean, here we are um, sitting side by side and, and, and we are still facing a tsunami of opportunity that's coming as a byproduct of, the adoption rate of emerging technology. Yeah. And we get the benefit from that, from you building what you build and me providing labor to build it, right? So um, this is a great time. Is there, like, is there anything I didn't ask you that you wanna make sure that if people remembered anything? You know, uh, just to circle back, uh, because we got sidetracked on why China cracked down on crypto, but the, yeah. the pivot of the company. Sorry about that. Uh, no, it, it, it turned into a, a great discussion, but that that pivot in 21 was in, in solving problems. So. China cracks down. Our GPUs are sitting in Shenzhen on a yes. dock in Shenzhen. Uh, we're like, well, you know, China's kind of threatened this before. Do we deploy this? Do we not deploy it? We ended up redirecting those uh, to the U.S. Um, but you know, I, I was sitting there for a day or two and going, our our business model was just like imploded, right? Yes. China, China just crushed us. Now. After it took me through the weekend, um, but we'd already been looking at sites in the U.S. and it, it just realized what like crazy opportunity had been created for us to go and build these data center campuses, you know, in in North America. And so we, you know, we, we'd already been working with the people, and then I just you know stepped on the gas as hard as I could, um, and the team did too. This just goes back to my team that I love and and how innovative and and resourceful they are. But you know that that was probably one of the biggest ones. And then the the move from that to what we're doing now was I would call it more evolutionary, right? We just I hired some guys that were you know that were building data centers for Meta back in twenty two to start doing the HPC stuff. Um, so that was a little more evolutionary for us. But that that kind of that moment of here was our business model. It's gone. And then, you know, it took a couple of days to figure out like, and then maybe a week or two to realize the, the insane opportunity that had created for us. And then we were able to just redirect and push, you know, on, on that new opportunity, um, has been, that, that was probably, you know, the, the most defining moment for the, for the history of the company. Well, that's great agility that, you know, demonstrated as a leader. So congratulations, a testament to, it takes a lot to pivot like that, knowing that you have a lot of souls that are dependent on you making those yeah. those decisions well, and and you're not always going to make them well. Human nature is that we sometimes pivot in the wrong direction. But it sounds like you you have the right team, not in right grit and the right willingness, and to go take some risks. So I'm always inspired by sitting down with other founders and business leaders because I mean, one of my biggest mentors or sponsors in this space. Um, it was relieving me one time when he's massively successful. And he's like, how many times do you find yourself in the fetal position on a monthly basis? And I was like, is that a real question? And I was like, is this a test? And I was like, three times? He's like, that's probably not enough. But, I'm like, <laughs> but he's like, if you're not there every week, you're not pushing hard enough. I'm like, I feel like I'm pushing as hard as I can, you know? So it's, it's awesome, but we get to grow something special in this space. And it seems like you have the ability to impact communities. And that's my purpose too. So, uh, I love it, man. So this has been a real pleasure for me. Kirk, thanks for having me. I loved it. Yeah, Wes, thanks for coming. Thanks for joining the revolution. And for any of you that listened, how can they find you, Wes? Uh, our website, uh, applieddigital.com is the, the easiest place to find us. Um, and you'll see me right on there. You can- You got it. Uh, you can get, they get you on LinkedIn. Way. They can catch me on LinkedIn. Uh, probably won't give my email out, but it's sure. hard to figure out. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got you. Well, listen, for all of you that are listening, thanks for listening. I hope you like this podcast. If you do, please, please like it and, and subscribe to the podcast. We need your, uh, we need your support. So thank you for everything you're doing for the industry. It's a real pleasure to sit down and have a conversation with you, Wes. I appreciate it. Same here. Thanks, thanks. for joining the revolution. I appreciate it.